1200 years ago, the people of Tibet developed a comprehensive medical system. They understood how the mind can powerfully affect the body. They knew subtle ways of changing the body's chemistry with medicines made from plants and minerals. They blessed their medicines and their patients in lengthy rituals. And they encoded this knowledge in a series of elaborate paintings. Today, Tibetan medicine is the focus of a worldwide interest in traditional medical knowledge. One of the conceits of present-day society is the notion that modern science, technology, and medicine have made the past irrelevant. But long before there was even science or medicine, people were observant and inventive as they developed ways to combat sickness, both physically and psychically. India and China have traditional practices that have roots in antiquity, and were gaining insights into traditional medicine from the near mythical kingdom of Tibet steeped in Buddhism that could be invaluable in industrialized countries as well. In Lhasa, Tibet, the birthplace of Tibetan medicine, much of Buddhist heritage has been dismantled or destroyed. Buddhism's ancient synthesis of priest and healer doesn't always coexist easily with communist ideology. But many Buddhists have hung on to their traditional beliefs. When the Buddha left his sheltered life, it was the shock of seeing someone who was sick, someone old, and then someone who had died that set him on the path to enlightenment. The Buddha himself claimed to be a healer, not a god and offered his teachings as remedies, not gospels. Known as Sangye Menla, he is the medicine Buddha, the master of remedies, the healing deity of Tibetan medicine. His radiant body is azure blue, the color of healing. In his hands, he holds a bowl filled with the nectar of long life and the flower of healing. Guided by centuries of practical science, Tibetan doctors are taught that there is nothing in the world that cannot be used in some form as a medicine. And their traditional knowledge includes turning a vast number of minerals and plants into medicinal compounds. Practitioners still use treatments that used to be part of Western medical practice, but have now been changed or abandoned. The ancient wisdom of Tibetan medicine resides in this stunning visual encyclopedia of the human body and psyche. Based on centuries of observation, these intricate paintings represent a blend of Buddhist spiritual teachings, a complex medical science, and an elegant art form. These paintings were made with a remarkable insight into how the human brain absorbs knowledge. They're a visual record created to pass along a vast amount of information in logical groupings. This tree branches off to display the three basic methods of diagnosis. First, observation. The leaves show the doctor how to look carefully at the patient's body, particularly the tongue and urine. 
The center branch shows the importance of touch and accurately taking the pulse. The last branch illustrates how the doctor should question the patient. Asking in detail about symptoms, past illnesses, daily habits, moods, diet, and any areas of pain. As Buddhists, Tibetan doctors were unburdened by beliefs in ritual purity or caste, so they were never reluctant to handle and examine bodily materials. This was probably why they were noted for their excellent diagnostic skills. Some Buddhists say that their book of medicine came directly from the Buddha or dropped from heaven here in the Yarlung Valley near Lhasa. Others with a more historical bent point to Tibet's first great king, Songsten Gampo. Under his auspices, Tibet held its first international medical conference in the 8th century inviting physicians from the neighboring countries of India, Nepal, Greece, Persia, and China to share their knowledge. Yurtak the Elder, the great sage of Tibetan medicine, took the essence of each system and created a distinctly Tibetan fusion reflected in the first widely accepted Tibetan medical text, the Four Tantras. In Europe in the 17th century, to be medically curious is a dangerous pursuit. At the same time that European doctors are defying the church by secretly dissecting bodies and herbalists and midwives are burned at the stake, medical knowledge is flourishing in Tibet under the direction of the fifth Dalai Lama. At this time, a Tibetan scholar wrote a brilliant new medical commentary a careful compilation of the leading-edge medical science of the time. He also commissioned a set of illustrations to accompany the new text. The medical wisdom of a thousand years of practice was distilled onto 79 cloth panels. To ensure that the illustrations were accurate, master painters visit the sky burials. Most corpses in Tibet were cut apart and offered to the vultures. At the funeral grounds, the actual construction of the human body was very clear. Traditionally, two or three of the brightest monks from each monastery would be chosen to study at a medical school in Lhasa. Over the years, these monk doctors traveled across the Tibetan plateau, spreading their medical knowledge and their Buddhist faith throughout Central Asia. They expand Tibetan influence north into Russia, establishing thriving Buddhist communities in Buracha, the region around Lake Baikal, between Mongolia and Siberia. The Tibetan culture takes root, expressing itself through the Buddhist religion and a uniquely Siberian variation of Tibetan culture. But the Tibetan medicine of Lhasa and faraway Buracha were to be tested by a new god of scientific socialism and progress. In Russia, the overthrow of the Tsars and the Bolshevik Revolution marked the beginning of a dark age for the Buddhists of Buracha. Stalin's purges in the 1930s release an inexplicable brutality on a massive scale. Monasteries are burned to the ground or reduced to rubble. Religious manuscripts and relics are looted and destroyed. Buddhist leaders are executed by the thousands. Tibetan Buddhists are also living on borrowed time. In 
March of 1959, the Chinese army invades Tibet. The people resist occupation and are crushed by Chinese troops. A hundred thousand Tibetans flee before the invading army. The Chinese demolish over 6,000 monasteries and temples and systematically destroy medical texts wherever they find them. In order to avoid being captured or killed, the Dalai Lama and a small group of monks and officials set out across the Himalayan mountains. The Dalai Lama finds refuge in Dharamsala, India. The exiled Tibetans are determined to keep their Buddhist faith and their science of healing alive. The heart of Tibetan culture continues now in exile in Dharamsala, the area in northern India granted to Tibetans after the Chinese invasion of their homeland. The Dalai Lama considers Tibet's unique medical tradition one of its most important contributions to human well-being. He insisted that one of the community's first projects should be setting up a new medical institute. Beginning in 1961 with one building, the large complex now houses a school and a facility for manufacturing traditional medicines. The handful of trained doctors who followed the Dalai Lama into exile were able to re-establish Tibet's entire medical system because, as a part of their traditional training, they had learned all of the ancient texts by heart. <laughs> Dr. Dawa guides his students through the seven-year course required to become a doctor of Tibetan medicine. But this classroom looks a little different from what it would have a hundred years ago. Not everyone is a monk. Many of the students are women, and a significant number of them plan to study Western medicine as well. The qualities necessary for a physician are to be knowledgeable and experienced. Another very important thing is that the doctor has to be kind-hearted and have a loving, compassionate nature. Dr. Dawa knows that Tibetan medicine must continue to evolve. We can't be content just to say Tibetan medicine is one of the most ancient systems of healing. We need to interact with modern medicine so we can authenticate our results and cross-reference our diagnoses and treatments to correct inaccuracies. That doesn't mean we should lose our identity in trying to imitate Western medicine. We need to create dialogue with Western science. In the West, scientific knowledge can have an uneasy fit with spirituality. But Dr. Dawa finds no contradiction between his understanding of medicine and his faith in the Buddha's teachings. Buddhist doctors believe that the healing they offer their patients is part of their own spiritual growth, a way to practice compassion on the path to enlightenment. In Tibetan medicine, healing is a collaboration between doctor and patient. No blinking lights or high-tech equipment. Dr. Dawa makes his diagnosis using careful observation, a trained sense of touch, and a real dialogue with his patient. Is this where it hurts? Ah, when you eat hot chilies. Do you get a headache when you eat too much oil or fat? Western medicine is good for acute ailments and for emergency cases, as when there are traumatic injuries. Whereas Tibetan medicine is good for long-standing conditions or chronic diseases, its particular strength is getting at the root cause of diseases, rather than masking or just treating the symptom. In the Tibetan system, one of the most important methods of diagnosis is by means of the pulse. But Dr. Dawa is doing more than checking how fast it is. 
He uses each of three fingers to evaluate the health of a different internal organ. Next, the urine. The color, odor, and characteristics of the bubbles in the urine all point to what might be out of balance in the patient's body. From the color of the urine and how the bubbles disappear, it seems this is a bit serious. Try to eat more fruit, but not sour fruit. For the time being, I will prescribe medicine for one week, then come back with another urine sample. Initially, almost every disease stems from an unwholesome diet or improper behavior, which cause imbalances in the body. According to the Tibetan knowledge of healing, the four main methods of treatment are correct diet and behavior, the appropriate medicine and accessory therapies like massage and acupuncture. In Dharamsala, the spiritual and physical elements of Tibetan medicine remain inextricably linked, but China and Russia have sought to sever the bond. Want to know what we're up to? Visit our website. In Ulan Ude, the capital city of Buracha, Buddhism and Tibetan medicine have not been completely embraced. Tuvan Dorji is a Buddhist monk and a doctor who practices traditional Tibetan medicine here. It hasn't always been easy. At times, he's been hounded by the KGB and forbidden to leave the country. Tuvan Dorji Radnayevich, also known as Tuvan Lama, may not be your image of a typical Buddhist monk. But complete with cell phone and a busy schedule, he's an Emchi Lama, a doctor of traditional Tibetan medicine. He works out of a small clinic in a Buddhist community center. Tuvan Dorji takes a vow very similar to the Hippocratic Oath, to do his utmost to cure and to treat every patient equally, regardless of age, race, or wealth. <laughs> he may be wearing the traditional robes of a monk, but Tuvan Dorji deals with some very contemporary medical issues. As a Buddhist, he's opposed to assisted suicide. He believes organ donation should be encouraged and thinks artificial insemination can be of great help to women who want children. Up to 30 patients a day walk through the doors of his clinic with every possible medical problem. It isn't that we ignore modern Western medicine. They have their own excellent aspects, such as surgical treatments and computer analysis. They can be very effective, and we can make use of them. In the future, I hope we can combine the good points of Western medicine and traditional Buddhist medicine. His first patient today is 11-month-old Zorik. He's back for a checkup for a skin condition. Tuvan Dorji is treating more and more patients with allergies and skin problems. He believes there's a link to the chemicals now found in food. Tuvan Dorji relies on a sensitive touch, careful observation, and quiet listening. And if the patient is too young for a conversation, it's all the more important to be aware of body language, the color of the skin, and overall energy. <laughs> With a baby, I look mainly at the face. It shows everything that would indicate inner diseases. A typical treatment starts with herbal medicine and changes in diet.
Come on now, Zorak, you need to take some medicine. You should give him natural food. Don't give him the artificial stuff in packages. That kind has lots of preservatives. For the first few months, we treated him with ointments and creams, but everything got worse and worse. It even affected his breathing. His skin would get inflamed and scab over and just peel off. The modern medicine didn't help, so we came here to see the Tuvan Lama. It was miraculous. His medicine helped at once. Zorik's cheeks healed and he started to breathe normally. <laughs> Unfortunately for Zorik, Tibetan herbal medicines aren't sugar-coated. As a Buddhist doctor, Tuvan Dorji believes he can help strengthen the healing power within his patients. He prays for each of them to regain their health and be freed from their suffering. Only a few of the highly trained M.G. Lamas had survived the brutalities of the 30s, and Buddhists were still considered class enemies by the Soviet state. So when Tuvan Dorji decided to become a Buddhist doctor, he faced some serious obstacles. But there were difficulties. To go to a Buddhist school, you had to get permission from the Communist Party's Central Committee all the way in Moscow. But here in Baracha, I was very lucky to meet Shambhar Dorje Gamboyev, the man who until the end of his life would always teach me. He got me into the institute and I graduated in 1982. When Tuvan Lama finished his medical training, he was forced to register with the KGB. All the lamas were supposed to tell on one another who was doing what and they tried to force us to spread rumors about each other and I refused to do this. Fortunately, they did not stop me from being a lama. I was allowed to go to Mongolia, but I was barred from going anywhere else so I couldn't leave the country to continue my education. It was a time when any kind of religious expression in Russia was considered ignorant or subversive. But the Buddhist belief that everything is impermanent turned out to be quite true. Things in Buracha were about to change once again. In 1989, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Buddhism was declared a legal religion and once again, the temples are a place of celebration. The monastery colleges that had been destroyed or abandoned are being rebuilt, and every family is proud to have one of their children become a monk. Tuvan Dorji has a more secure future as a Buddhist doctor. He has a medical license from the Russian government, though it doesn't allow him to practice at the local hospital. Today's first patient is Mrs. Galma. She's a social worker and sees the Tuvan Dorji for both physical and spiritual reasons. He listens to her anxiety over a court decision being handed down today. If things go badly for her partner, he may be sentenced to three years in jail. Mrs. Galma receives a blessing and a prayer for a good outcome. Mrs. 
A doctor must have a big heart. He must understand his patient's soul and help them psychologically and spiritually. Along with being knowledgeable, he should be open-minded. He can't keep himself isolated from the world. He can't stay inside a capsule. The M.C. Lama is now my personal physician. He's the kind of person that you can open up your soul to. He has such understanding eyes. Health and mind are connected. And the most important thing is that the doctor and the patient are friends. Atsagat is about an hour's drive from the capital of Ulan Ude. It's one of a network of Buddhist monasteries built in this region. Tuvan Dorji used to be the head of this monastery and still comes back to take part in the temple rituals. Nephew Genghis, who himself hopes to become a doctor one day, spends the summers here learning all he can about Tibetan medicine from his uncle. Autumn is the time to harvest many of the plants used in traditional medicines. The plant's energies concentrate in the roots as leaves and fruit fall away. You stay here and guard the house. Tuvan Dorji and Genghis head out to gather licorice, an important ingredient in medicine to treat coughs. Trekking to remote places to harvest medicinal herbs has always been a part of a doctor's training. The root here is thin, usually it's thicker. It's very sweet. During the hard years, back in the 40s, licorice root was used instead of sugar. We would give it to the children. Just dig on this side, Genghis. If we dug around and destroyed the root system and took all of it, that would be bad. We have to be careful, because the plants are our future. It's not only you who comes to collect here, but other people. Well, Genghis, this will be enough for one, maybe two years. We'll see. Maybe we'll go out again next year. And what is the licorice root used for? We'll make a medicine with it to treat coughs. It helps clear the chest. Over the centuries, Tibetan doctors acquired a vast knowledge of plant habitat and medical uses. From tonics for the immune system to sedatives and antiviral compounds, they learned how to purify and combine plants to treat a wide range of diseases. Even though over one-third of our own pharmaceuticals are derived from plant sources, there are still many secrets to unlock from centuries of Tibetan botanical knowledge. Tuvan Dorji introduces his nephew to the same ancient texts and medical illustrations that he learned from. At that time there were no young lamas. They were all 70 or 80 years of age and had been in prison. Only a few of them had somehow survived the brutality of the 1930s. I was lucky to find a teacher. Tuvan Dorji has mastered the art of pulse diagnosis.
and he wants to make sure that Genghis will be able to use this technique when it's time for him to treat patients. Your hands have to be like this. Try not to leave them in cold water for very long. Also, make sure you wear gloves if you hold a hot cup. You have to take care of these three fingers. So if you want to enhance their sensitivity, you should soak them in warm milk. Remember as you diagnose your patients, these fingers are our weapons against disease. Traditionally, Buddhist doctors make their own medicines. It's a skill Tuvan Dorji wants Genghis to learn. We'll prepare this five-part mixture that has to be taken with water. It's very useful after a heart attack. It's like a tonic for the heart. You know all the ingredients, nutmeg, Indian long pepper, mudan, anam and ginger. Here, I'll show you. A thorough knowledge of the plants is something that will take years. But meanwhile, a willing young person can be very helpful with the more laborious part of things. Put your weight evenly at both ends. And don't forget to keep reciting the Medicine Buddha mantra. Finished at last, after six long hours. Yes, wonderful. Very well done. When you prepare a medicine like the one we have ground here, it is so far only a mixture, not yet a medicine. Now we have to read the mantra, the mantra for the medicine Buddha. The prayers energize the medicine and strengthen its healing powers. In the past, these ritual prayers that give the medicines the power to cure could be held over a period of months. This particular blessing is conducted over five days and nights. Both monks and the students of the medical school take part. Want to know what we're up to? Visit our website. Plummeting temperatures and fresh snow mark the beginning of the Siberian winter, magnificently harsh and delicate. In Kiva de Zidma has come all the way to Atsagat Datsun to consult with Tuvan Dorji. I see that you've lost weight. It's because of this terrible disease. I have cancer. She was diagnosed at a hospital in town with stomach cancer. But it's important to her to get his diagnosis and his advice too. As he holds her frail arm, he can immediately tell that her condition is terminal. 
Please be still. When did you start feeling bad? Last autumn. What do you eat these days? Porridge and fish. I also take some oil mixed with alcohol. The doctor said it would kill the pain. It's true that your condition is not very good. Does your stomach hurt? Yes, around here. Regardless of whether it gets better or worse, please do not forget your prayers. As he sees her to the door, he knows he may be saying goodbye. He encourages her to keep a calm mind and seek refuge in the Buddha. I've lived a long life, and my children have grown up. Like all Buddhist doctors, Tuvan Dorji has a great responsibility for helping his patients through the last stages of life. He helps each one make their own journey, encouraging them to find refuge in the Buddha's teachings and the prospect of rebirth. She is completely aware that death is near at hand. I think she is a very courageous woman. She can fight the disease a little longer, but mainly she needs to keep a calm mind and prepare for her death. Here, there are no frantic attempts to prolong life at any cost. A patient's death isn't a failure. It's a transition, an awakening from the dream of life. Today, Tuvan Lama is presiding over a funeral of a resident of Atsagatsi village. His role has switched from healer to spiritual leader. Reincarnation is a matter of fact to us Buddhists. The soul is reborn over and over again, getting closer to enlightenment each time. Whether you are born a monk, a laborer, a scientist or a farmer, you must try to develop your inner spirit. If you do not surrender yourself to anger or cruelty in this life, you will climb the ladder one more step in the next. In this way, we try to become as much like the Buddha as possible with each life that we live. Burning the photograph severs the last connection of the deceased person to this world. The purpose of the burial rite is to let the soul leave in peace and find rebirth. In Buddhism, this present life is considered to be a preparation for death and the new lives to follow. The coffin is turned away from the village so the soul won't be able to find its way back. Relatives visit the graves for 49 days, at which point the soul will be reborn. Simple wooden stakes with banners of the sun, moon, and mantras mark the graves. Relatives circle the grave three times in a final farewell. Tuvan Dorji is the last to leave. He must close the path so the soul cannot follow them back to the village. But death is always followed by renewal and life. Here at the Atsagat Datsun, Genghis is helping organize the New Year's fire ceremony. Two fires will be lit. It's the biggest party of the season, and the rituals owe as much to Burat tradition as they do to Buddhism. 
All that is good and pure should be brought to one fire, and all that's bad and negative is brought to the second fire to burn away completely. People come here to leave their sickness and go to the other fire to become pure again and to be prosperous and healthy. People start to gather at dusk. They bring bags of wheat flour balls, which they've rubbed over their bodies. They believe they'll be rid of all earthly desires and karma when the balls are burnt in the fire. The paper skull is an offering to Yamaraja, the king of life and death. As the two fires light up the winter sky, one burns away the failures of the past year. The other lights the way for health and happiness in the new one. Buddhism and Tibetan medicine go together. They are inseparable. Other people may think differently, but I believe you have to know the foundation of Buddhism to understand the foundations of the medicine. You need to understand it with your body, your mind, and your soul. Buddhist medicine will be alive as long as we pass on the heritage to new generations. As long as patients want to be treated with Emchi Lamas, we will keep our tradition, and I believe people will come to us for help. As long as Buddhist medicine has the power to heal, Human beings face four main sufferings. They are part and parcel of life. Birth, sickness, old age, death. It is very important to know why we face these problems in our life. If we realize and understand these things, it helps us maintain a positive attitude. The Tibetan culture in Lhasa was damaged in the last century by tides of history that shook the entire world. But change is the rule, not the exception. The atlas of Tibetan medicine was once suppressed by revolution. Now, all 79 paintings are available as digital files on the internet. The spirit of the medicine Buddha, the master of remedies, continues through the centuries to minister to the bodies and souls of the faithful. It's time to enter our third annual Nature in Focus Environmental Photography Contest. Amateur photographers are invited to submit original photos to win prizes including a trip for two to the Yukon and digital cameras from Nikon Canada. Winners will be published in Harrowsmith Country Life magazine. For more details, check out our website. Mark Winston has dedicated his life to unraveling the mysteries surrounding the honeybee. Bees connect us to this deep place in nature because they're social, and we're social. An extraordinary journey inside the hive, where for the first time, HD cameras capture the magic of the bee world. Bee Talker, next time on The Nature of Things.
Known as Sangye Menla, he is the medicine Buddha, the master of remedies, the healing deity of Tibetan medicine. His radiant body is azure blue, the color of healing. In his hands, he holds a bowl filled with the nectar of long life and the flower of healing. Guided by centuries of practical science, Tibetan doctors are taught that there is nothing in the world that cannot be used in some form as a medicine. And their traditional knowledge includes turning a vast number of minerals and plants into medicinal compounds. One of the conceits of present-day society is the notion that modern science, technology, and medicine have made the past irrelevant. But long before there was even science or medicine, people were observant and inventive as they developed ways to combat sickness, both physically and psychically. India and China have traditional practices that have roots in antiquity, and were gaining insights into traditional medicine from the near mythical kingdom of Tibet steeped in Buddhism that could be invaluable in industrialized countries as well. In Lhasa, Tibet, the birthplace of Tibetan medicine, much of Buddhist heritage has been dismantled or destroyed. Buddhism's ancient synthesis of priest and healer doesn't always coexist easily with communist ideology. But many Buddhists have hung on to their traditional beliefs. When the Buddha left his sheltered life, it was the shock of seeing someone who was sick, someone old, and then someone who had died that set him on the path to enlightenment. The Buddha himself claimed to be a healer, not a god and offered his teachings as remedies, not gospels. Practitioners still use treatments that used to be part of Western medical practice, but have now been changed or abandoned. The ancient wisdom of Tibetan medicine resides in this stunning visual encyclopedia of the human body and psyche. Based on centuries of observation, these intricate paintings represent a blend of Buddhist spiritual teachings, a complex medical science, and an elegant art form. Twelve hundred years ago, the people of Tibet developed a comprehensive medical system. They understood how the mind can powerfully affect the body. They knew subtle ways of changing the body's chemistry with medicines made from plants and minerals. They blessed their medicines and their patients in lengthy rituals. and they encoded this knowledge in a series of elaborate paintings. Today, Tibetan medicine is the focus of a worldwide interest in traditional medical knowledge. 